Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at Yamaha's 1988 YZ125. This is a machine I actually have a lot of personal experience with. I own an 88 YZ125. It was a really interesting machine, kind of a mixed bag in some ways, in my opinion. At the time, I was coming off my 87 KX125, and this bike had a, such a different power band to it. It was unlike any other 125 I've ever ridden at that point. It was this really strong low to mid delivery. Kind of reminded me, uh, kind of like my 2005 KTM 200. It had a lot of grunt. I mean, you could ride it around without even getting the power valve open. It was just weird in that way. Made it great for trail riding. At the time, or riding a little bit of racing, mostly just play riding. If we're riding around like the, the tracks and trails we ride on, it was awesome for that. When you got it out on a motocross track where it's a little more wide open, it was a little more dicey. The, the power band just was so narrow focused. It was like low to mid and there was all this hit and then nothing. I mean, it felt like it just hit a wall when you tried to scream it, which was just so different than any other 125 I had ridden. And the real problem for me, at least, was the transmission. The transmission was so hard to shift. I ended up actually getting uh, one of the Race Tech shifters, which is an accessory that Race Tech was making at the time. That is almost like a street bike contraption. It would move the the shift point all the way back to the uh, swing arm pivot, gave it like so much more leverage, and it actually made a tremendous difference in terms of the way the shifting was. Before I did that, though, I ended up bending two shift shafts coming out of the transmission. I actually tried to shift the thing so hard that I bent the shaft coming out of the transmission by trying to downshift under power. It just would not work. You had to back off the throttle, feed a little clutch. It, the bike was just impossible to power shift. And on a 125, you know, that's that's a critical problem. <laughs> Sometimes you, you need to snap that shift off quickly, especially when the bike has a narrow spread of power. I think it did handicap its performance. I thought the suspension was really good this year. I thought the bike handled pretty well as well for me. Um, maybe not quite as excellent at turning as like my um, CR I got later, but it was a pretty good all-around handler. I had no issues with that. Uh, probably the biggest thing, though, was that shifting. It just was such an annoyance. It made me kind of crazy with trying to get the darn thing to shift. But other than that, a real fun bike. It's certainly uh, one of the best jumpers. I mean, that, that low to mid burst, man, it would get you out of turn so much easier where like uh, my Honda's later, you know, you'd have to really kind of rail the turn and, and get it up in the power band because there was, wasn't a lot of torque to fall back on. And that YZ, it just had that instant snap of power, kind of like the late, uh, late 80s, early 90s RMs, same thing. That low to mid snap helped to get out of turns really. It made it easier for, you know, tricky doubles out of turns. Just didn't have that long pull uh, once you got it open. Good bike overall, though, like I said. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've done retrospectives on all kinds of different machines. I just did a really long one, an hour and a half long look back at the Yamaha YZ400, 426, and 450. Basically the history of the four strokes. I plan on doing one on the YZ250F in the future and probably Honda's as well. Kind of work my way through the brands. Those take me a long time to do. A lot of work, so it's several months of research when I'm putting them together, but I do enjoy doing them. Uh, you can find the retrospectives on that, the Honda CR250, uh, many other individual reviews like this as well on my channel. If you like to support what I do, uh, you can check out Motocross Vault Merch on my Teespring store. I'll put a link here in the description and a card here in the video. I have all kinds of designs from Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda, uh, kind of a little bit of everything, whether it's an ATV or an off-road machine or something like that. I, I probably have something on my channel that might work for you. And if you could check that out, I would very much appreciate it. So here, without further ado, is the story of the 1988 Yamaha YZ125. The 1980s were a real up-and-down decade for Yamaha's 125 motocross program. At the start of the decade, the YZ125 was one of the best bikes in the class. It was fast, light, and generally did a great job of going faster on the racetrack. In 1981, however, the balance of power shifted back to Suzuki with the arrival of their groundbreaking full floater suspension system. The 1981 RM125 laid waste to the competition and made the old school monoshock on the Yamaha look like yesterday's news. In 1982, the YZ fought back with an all new power valve motor that roosted on the competition but it offered oddball handling and a rear suspension system that lacked the finesse of Suzuki's full floater system. In 1983, Yamaha came out with an all-new YZ125, and this new machine offered a great deal of improvements in most every area. The new chassis was better laid out, offering better weight distribution and improved handling, and the suspension was definitely upgraded over previous models, but once again the Yamaha was forced to play second fiddle, this time to the upstart Honda CR125. In 1984, however, things started trending in the wrong direction for the YZ. 
An all-new bike turned out to be the dog of the class, and the Yamaha slid from second to a distant last in the 125 standings. The 1985 season brought with it an all-new look here in America, with the white and red of international machines making its way to the U.S. market. But the same old bow wow of a motor held the Yamaha back in the standings. The 85YZ was slow, poorly suspended, and a complete embarrassment on the track. Trying to extract more horsepower out of the motor only made it less reliable, and to this day it stands as one of the worst 125 outings in the history of the class. After two years of utter futility in the 125 division, it was time for a fresh start in 1986. An all-new YZ125 moved to a case read induction and introduced a slim layout that rivaled the Honda for its fit and feel. The new bike was worlds faster than 1985, but harder to ride than the omnipotent Honda CR. Its mid-range motor was fast, but its overall spread of power was very narrow, and its notchy gearbox made keeping it in the sweet spot of its power difficult. Overall, it was the most improved bike of 1986, but not quite up to capturing the title of top 125 in the land. For 1987, Yamaha ditched the red radiator shrouds and worked on refining the solid 86 package. The new bike offered a beefy low-end punch and some of the worst forks ever seen on a motocross machine. The new travel control valve, or TCV Kayaba forks, were incredibly harsh and virtually unrideable in stock condition. They held back an otherwise solid package and made the Yamaha cannon fodder for the redesigned Honda CR125R. With yet another disappointing season in the rearview mirror, Yamaha set about bringing their second banana up to snuff for 1988. First up on the agenda was an upgrade in the suspension. The unloved TCV forks were retired and replaced with Kiaba's all-new 43mm cartridge units. These new forks offered far finer damping control and a quantum leap forward in performance. Complementing the new forks were an all-new shock, a revamped motor, new bars, better brakes, revised graphics, and a new coat of silver paint for the motor. In the motor department, there were two major issues that needed addressing for 1988. The motor's lack of top-end power and notoriously poor shifting. Since 1986, the YZ125 had been plenty fast, but its power was long on punch and short on duration. It came on strong down low, particularly for a 125, and hit very hard in the mid-range, but it threw out the anchor if you tried to rev it any past that. In an effort to coax a little more revs out of their 123cc case reed mill, Yamaha enlarged the reed valve and redesigned its shape to mimic that of an FMF unit. They streamlined the Yamaha power valve system for less restriction and changed the ignition timing. An all-new pipe, revised porting, and a rebalancing of the flywheel were further added to try and free up the YZ's reluctance to rev. In the shifting department, Yamaha took a two-pronged attack to rectify its notoriously poor action. First, they upgraded the clutch with an additional fiber plate, one more spring, and a switch to needle bearings for the actuator. In the transmission, they increased the main shaft diameter by 2 millimeters and beefed up the gears for more durability. Unfortunately, all these motor upgrades did not really do a whole lot to change the overall performance of the Yamaha's motor. It remained the same hard-hitting, low to mid-range motor it had been the previous two years. Low-end torque was remarkable for a 125, and the little yammer positively barked out of turns. It had by far the most low-end and mid-range in the class, but once again fell short past the mid-range. If you nailed each shift perfectly and caught the next gear before the power flattened out, it was brutally fast and effective. But if you tried to stretch out that gear a second too far, the motor stopped pulling like you sucked a chipmunk into the airbox. It was the ultimate burst motor, and riders either loved or hated its punchy delivery. For those accustomed to the Honda's endless rev, the YZ could be frustrating. Unlike the CR, which just kept pulling and pulling the longer you left it on, the YZ demanded a perfectly timed shift to keep it on the bubble. With its unorthodox power band, the YZ preferred a more open bike approach. Keep it a gear tall, ride the torque curve, and slip in another cog before the motor stopped pulling. Of course, this could be frustrating as well, because the YZ's transmission continued to be the worst in the class by a wide margin. The new transmission proved no more adept at changing gears than the old one had been. The new clutch worked well enough, but the gearbox itself refused to change gears under a load. Under throttle, it was virtually impossible to upshift or downshift without backing off the throttle and feeding in some clutch. With each shift being so critical to making its narrow power band work, keeping the YZ at full boil could be an exasperating experience. If you nailed each shift right and kept it on the bubble, the YZ could fly, but if you muffed one of those shifts, you could be left stomping on the gear shift lever and fanning the clutch as the competition roosted by. While the motor and transmission weren't much of an improvement, the all-new suspension turned out to be anything but. The new 43mm cartridge forks were night and day better than 1987. They were plush on small hits and worked reasonably well on big impacts. There was none of the harshness that had pounded riders' wrists the year before, and they offered much better control in the rough. 
Faster and heavier riders probably would be happier with stiffer springs, but overall they were a vast improvement and on par with the competition in 1988. In the rear, Yamaha finally ditched their creative but controversial brake actuated suspension system for 1988. The BASS was supposed to improve tracking under braking, but most riders found the YZs actually worked better with the system disconnected. The new piggyback Kayaba shock also revised the compression adjustment by switching to a bleed type adjuster from the pop-off valve of 1987. Both the swing arm and monocross linkage remained largely unchanged for the new year. On the track, the new shock performed more or less the same as it had the year before. It was good at charging obstacles, but busy in off-throttle situations. If ridden aggressively, it did a good job of absorbing the track, but once you backed off, it got slightly unpredictable. On square edge whoops and braking bumps, it was prone to kicking suddenly and was never quite settled. No amount of spinning of dials ever got rid of this unsettled behavior, and most riders found keeping their weight back and holding on for dear life the best remedy. In terms of overall handling, the YZ was a bit of a mixed bag. The inherent stability of the chassis was quite good, but the hop rear shock could often make that a moot point. Once the rear shock was dialed in, however, the YZ was as steady at speed as a bullet train. In the corners, the abrupt nature of the power, however, and the YZ's light front end made it difficult to always hit the intended line. Wheelies out of turns were common, and the bike never felt as sure and planted as a scalpel-like Honda. With its slim layout and smooth bodywork, the Yamaha was easy to move around on, and a very able flyer. Like most 125s, it felt very light in the air and on the ground, and its handling shortcomings were not nearly as much of a handicap as they would have been on a heavier or more powerful machine. In the braking department, the YZ125 made major strides in 1988 by finally stepping up to a disc in the rear. Although extremely cobby looking, the new 220mm disc offered a lot of power. Its main weakness was its gravity feel, which took a lot of getting used to. Those accustomed to the previous drum or Honda's excellent rear stopper were likely to find themselves stalling the YZ several times before becoming familiar with the Yamaha's light switch-like engagement. Up front, the disc size was increased 10mm for 1988 to a total of 230mm. This gave the brake more bite, but again, not as much feel as the well-modulated dual piston units found in the Honda. Overall, they got the job done, but they lacked the feel of the best binders in the class. In the detailing department, the YZ125 for 1988 was pretty typical for its time. Things like its butter soft steel bars, rock hard grips, brittle levers, and cheesy fasteners were all par for the course in the mid 80s. The lack of a fully removable rear subframe was less forgivable, as Honda, KTM, and Kawasaki all had them offered on their machines in 1988. Probably the most annoying feature, however, was Yamaha's chain buffer, which was as hard as a rock and noisy enough to be heard over the motor when riding. That telltale clackety clack became an unfortunate YZ trademark in the mid 80s. In the plus column were the Yamaha's slim ergonomics, comfortable seat, easy to access filter, and excellent overall reliability. Even with its cranky transmission, nothing in the motor broke, and the YZ became a popular choice for off-road enthusiasts looking for a 125 that could take major punishment. The lack of top end hurt it in the desert, but the excellent bottom end torque and plush forks were perfect for woods work, and it was a very versatile bike that was fun to ride and durable. In 1988, Yamaha produced a polarizing 125. Its potent low to mid motor made it both unique and more adept at off road than your typical 125, but its stubborn gearbox and precipitous drop off in top end power made it a hard bike to ride fast. Unlike the typical 125, the Yamaha was no pin it to the stops and hang on type of bike. It was a machine that required skill and careful gear selection to make it work. Get it right and you flew, get it wrong and you were left sucking wind as the competition blew by. For those who made it work, the YZ was fast and fun. For those who couldn't, the Yamaha was frustrating. For 125 hot shoes, the Honda CR125R was probably a better choice, but for those who enjoyed a distinctive flavor, the 88YZ125 could be a potent motocross weapon. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 1988 YZ125, a bike that I had that I really enjoyed. Like I said, there were some quirks to it. It was a lot of fun to ride. I had this 88 and then I had the 89 later. Um, I think the 89 did handle a little better than this 88 and certainly the new layout was better, but they're both kind of similar running machines at very narrow power bands, lots of burst, not a lot of pull. I remember when I got off the Yamahas and got uh, my 1990 CR125, um, I just couldn't believe how long the power band was. That that bike just seemed to pull forever and ever and ever. And after you get used to riding these kind of snappy burst motors, it was just a weird transition there. So it's amazing how much different the bikes were back in the day. You know, now there's kind of a sameness to a lot of the machines. They all are very good. Obviously, they have different traits, but the four strokes have made it so all the power bands are very wide and stuff. In the old days, man, a Honda ro ran nothing like a Suzuki, which ran nothing like a, a Yamaha and a Kawasaki. They were all 
very different machines. And that's kind of probably what makes it a little bit uh, more fun to look back at some of these machines because they had so much personality. They had so much differences, and uh, some are definitely better than others. Uh, overall, I'd say this is a good bike in 1988, but uh, it was hard to beat Hondas in this era. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. If you could share on social media, tell your friends about it, uh, like the video, comment below. I would really appreciate it. It helps grow the channel. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.